King Kong vs. Godzilla from 1962 is the third Godzilla movie and also the third Kong movie. While this movie is called King Kong vs. Godzilla, the actual fight between them doesn't happen until the last 10 minutes of the movie, and throughout the entire thing, it almost seems like two separate movies happening at the same time. I guess we should also mention the Japanese version of this movie was not available legally in the United States until very recently. And we will be discussing the Japanese version and the American version. Well, the very first thing we notice in the Japanese version is the awesome music, which is super epic, gets you super excited for what's coming. The quality of the music recording is also much higher than the previous two movies. It is used in the American version as well, just at a different part. But as soon as I heard it, all these memories started coming back because as a kid, we had the American version. And it was in that big plasticky clamshell VHS <laughs> case. I had the same one, yeah. We are introduced to Mr. Taco, who is the head of a pharmaceutical company sponsoring a science program on TV that is getting low ratings. I thought Mr. Taco was awesome. He was probably... One of my favorite human characters in this movie. He's very over-the-top comedic, but in this case it completely works, especially since he's basically the first person you see in the movie, so you know what you're going to get right from the beginning. He has very good timing. He's played by Arishima Ichiro, who was, by this point, already an established comedy actor in Japan. So if you were watching this over there, you would have been even more sure that this was just going to be a straight comedy. I was surprised at how comedic this movie turned out to be. But the comedy was handled very well, unlike in Godzilla Rates Again, which attempted humor, but annoyed me instead. And I like how Taco's always flipping a coin and making important decisions based on what it lands on. His physical acting is really good, too. <laughs> <laughs> like when he's fainting, basically when he reacts to stuff. Very vaudeville. He sends cameraman Sakurai and sound guy Furue to Faroe Island because there are rumors of an evil mammoth spirit, and they want to get the TV ratings up. The movie kind of jumps around between different scenes in a somewhat haphazard way, I would say. And it throws in certain plot elements that sometimes don't come up for a really long time. And that's one thing I will say that the American version improved a little bit, is that they make those elements feel more important early on. You kind of know that they're going to come up later. In the Japanese version, it feels almost like random scenes. An example would be the super strong threat. Sakurai's sister, Humiko, is hanging out with her boyfriend, Fujita, who decides to demonstrate this thread out on a balcony, and he's going to be leaving to test its use on ships. And while all this is going on, we keep cutting to a UN submarine investigating melting icebergs in the Arctic. It's got a bunch of American people on board, and I've seen the American version, and I guess I just assumed that was just part of the American version. They stuck it in there. But watching the Japanese version, they're in there too, and their acting and their speaking is ridiculous. The water temperature 18 degrees centigrade. 18 degrees? It can't be. There can't be a warm current running in the Arctic Sea. Check that temperature. Yes, sir. And it's even worse in the Japanese version because they were dubbed over in the American version, making it a little easier to understand them. They were just random American people that they could find or English-speaking people that they pulled in off the street and said, hey, you're going to be in this movie. That's why they were so terrible. You even have some Japanese people there that don't get any dialogue and just kind of cower off in the corner in a really goofy way. Yeah, I like how they're always <laughs> hugging each other when there's danger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and these scenes... In the Japanese version are spread out into multiple segments, but when we cut back to the Japanese characters, they're talking about events that are happening days apart from each other, and we go back to the submarine, and they're still in the same place doing the exact same thing. We see them heading to the iceberg that is within visual range, and it apparently takes them multiple days to get there. And all the scenes with the Japanese characters are the ones that get all the humor. The scenes that are leading up to Godzilla, who of course emerges from the iceberg, are played seriously up until Godzilla actually encounters Kong later. One unintentionally funny moment for me was when the sub crashed into the iceberg. We're getting closer. Up underwater periscope. We must be getting close, and the next shot is them right <laughs> in the middle of it. Yeah, the most incompetent American <laughs> characters ever. Even though we know it's Godzilla inside, I did like that they didn't just show him right away. The only indication is his roar. <laughs> So 
Sakurai and Furue get to the island, and they are wearing these ridiculous safari outfits. There were some cool matte paintings throughout this whole movie. They were cool, but they were not very realistic. They have a translator guide with them named Kono, who is played by Don Knotts' long-lost Japanese brother. <laughs> he was really funny, and I wish he was in the movie more, because we only get him on the island. I like his walking when he's translating between the two parties. He's wearing very convincing brown face, as are all the people on the island, and that was sarcasm. When they talk to the village leader, some of the things that he says are in English, right? which was interesting. You go back wrong place, belong you pharaoh! Sakurai and Furue have a good comedic balance between the two, where Sakurai is the straight man, but he's also kind of an idiot still. The other guy is very goofy and always afraid, and Sakurai pretends he's not until things actually start happening. And since this movie is really balancing on their chemistry, it's a good thing it worked out. They initially mistake the giant spirit for lightning, but then turns out to be Kong, and I also like in this case that only Kong's roar is heard before he's actually seen. Even though everything is super goofy in this movie, they still handle the monster build-up stuff pretty well. I imagine the Kong vs. Godzilla movie that's coming out soon will be equally tactful. <laughs> <laughs> when we cut back to Sakurai's sister, Humiko, she's hanging out with her friend, and I'm sure being a James Bond fan, you noticed that the two of them appeared in that James Bond movie where he goes to Japan. Hell yeah. <laughs> and we'll see both of them in future movies as well. Humiko is played by Hamamie, and her friend is played by Wakabayashi Akiko. So Godzilla finally emerges from the iceberg, and we get our first occurrence of the classic Godzilla arrival theme. Oh, it's Godzilla! <laughs> Literally the same scene, he is coming ashore and being met by the army. I'm impressed that they were able to get their forces out immediately, literally within seconds. My question was, did they know Godzilla was in that iceberg? And if so, maybe it was a preemptive thing in case he ever got out. That would make sense, but nobody actually mentions that. It would have been a good explanation. The model work for all the army stuff, and really, in general, for this movie. It was pretty good. I agree, but I would say it was a slight step down from the previous two movies. Yeah. Especially when Godzilla wrecks that empty control tower. I also felt like the model work, especially for the moving stuff in this scene, could have been shot a little bit differently. Yeah, that's something that was disappointing about this movie. In the first movie in particular, you had a lot of those low-angle shots that really accentuated the scale of everything. And this movie just kind of points the camera at things that are happening. It was a little disappointing. The scientist for this movie who's going to let everybody know what's going on is Dr. Shigesawa, who knows a lot, apparently. He explains Godzilla being alive using science, and that's in quotation marks. He explains a lot in this movie using... Weird science anecdotes? Yeah, and just assumptions based on something. <laughs> I like how everybody keeps asking him questions that there is no way he would know the answer to or even have any idea about. But he's generic scientist man, so of course he knows everything about science. It was almost like they were trying to get a Sarazawa type figure in there, but it didn't really work. He was definitely confident in his answers, and he wasn't a bad actor. It just didn't make any sense. Right. Well, he's played by Hirata Akihiko, who did play Dr. Sarazawa in the first movie. Right. This is a big step down for him, unfortunately. He doesn't even play any important parts in the movie or reveal anything important. He's just there to try to make the movie seem a little bit more legitimate with its science, which really does not work. He says Godzilla is going to come to Japan. He says it's his homeland back in prehistoric times or whatever. Which was not established in the previous movies at all. Meanwhile, they're still searching for the giant spirit on this island. So we have three things kind of going on. We have the typical Godzilla movie where he's coming to shore and everyone's preparing. We have this other movie where they're searching on this island for Kong. And the only thing that's really tying them together is this TV station subplot. On the island, a giant octopus starts attacking. I always liked this scene as a kid. I did think the sound effects were a little much though. <laughs> sounds like someone's just digging their arm in a giant vat of oatmeal or something. 
the superimposing of people in front of the octopus was really bad, though. Especially when the camera pans to the side to keep the octopus on screen. We also get a little bit of stop motion when it grabs one of the villagers <laughs> and flips him around a little bit. Yeah. Not the best that I've ever seen. I do want to mention that some fans seem to think that this octopus is called Oldako. That literally just means giant octopus in Japanese. It doesn't have a name, it's just a giant octopus. So to combat this thing, Kong shows up with his big floppy ass arms. <laughs> <laughs> And he easily tears down the wall that they had built up there. The physical acting of the person in the suit is unique. I felt like it stood out. And they have some decent mobility in that suit. It helps to make up for the subpar design of the suit itself. That face is not great. <laughs> and those extended arms that he has sometimes, but not other times, depending on whether he actually needs to grab something in his hands or not. Yeah. It also bothers me how pretty much the entire movie, every time he roars, he never opens his mouth. This suit tends to be regarded among fans as the worst out of all the suits in the Godzilla movies. I don't know if I necessarily agree, but it's definitely toward the bottom. It's definitely bad. But given that this movie is a comedy, it honestly doesn't bother me that much. Yeah. So what prior Kong movies did we have from Japan? There were a couple of rip-offs one of which was about a guy who was only playing Kong in a play, and both of them are lost, so the quality of the effects in those movies is pretty much unknown. Unfortunate. Kong ends up chasing off the octopus. After a steamy makeout session. <laughs> <laughs> and he starts drinking juice that's been made out of fruit that grows on the island and starts getting sleepy. And then we hear the cool music again as they lull him to sleep. <laughs> And Sakurai decides they should take him back to Japan. So it pretty much is following the American King Kong movie model. Right. Send to the ship for anchor chains and tools. What are you going to do? I'll build a raft to float them to the ship. Why, the whole world will pay to see this. I liked in this one how the human characters mattered, and they were unique, and I actually liked them, unlike in Godzilla Rates Again, where I don't even remember if there were human characters in that movie. On the more serious side, we have Fumiko and her boyfriend, but they all matter. That was good. Agreed. And I like the actions of the human characters. They make sense. And I would say the human characters drive the plot just as much as the monsters do. Agreed. They end up towing Kong on a raft behind a boat, and Mr. Taco decides to come along in his own ridiculous expedition gear. But they are intercepted by the Japanese Navy, who tells them they cannot take Kong into Japanese waters due to safety concerns. And also, they are suspected of smuggling, which I thought was funny. So this is a great example of the actions taken by the human characters as making sense. Not letting Kong in. They also choose not to fire at Godzilla once he's well into the mainland. I like how they seek out scientists for answers to help combat Godzilla. And I also like how they set up multiple plans instead of putting all their eggs in one basket. Right. So they have dynamite attached to Kong's raft, and when he starts trying to break loose, they blow it up. It doesn't work, so then he starts to head to Japan, too. And then the generic scientist guy says the monsters can instinctively sense each other because science. <laughs> it's a lazy way to move things toward a battle, and it doesn't end up mattering anyway, because later the humans force them to fight. Okay, so this battle, you think it's coming, but then it turns out to be a dud. How did you feel about that? I thought it was interesting and unexpected. Definitely. I think the reason they did it was just to show that Godzilla is way more powerful at first, so that later when Kong gets charged up, you know that Kong has become way more powerful than he was the first time. I guess. Because I looked at the timestamp and I said, there's a lot of this movie left. How can they be fighting right now? But my favorite reaction was Kong's reaction when he gets hit by Godzilla's fire. <laughs> yeah, he's a pretty good comedy actor too. And I also like how he just kind of turns around and scratches his head and walks away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might be my favorite part of the whole movie. <laughs> this is the first time that we get Godzilla doing his weird arm clap, and his shoulder blades make a weird clicking sound. I thought that was a weird thing for them to stick in there. It happens throughout the movie. Yeah, very weird. So since they're both in Japan now, 
these two separate movies are now competing for the screen time. And it raised some questions for me because it seems like they're only focusing on one thing at a time. It kind of worked when they were at totally separate locations, but now that both monsters are together, they don't really know how to juggle that. Right. The military commander that's in charge of combating Godzilla ends up also being the one dealing with Kong. I would have thought they would have had separate forces dealing with each one since they're in different places at first. I did like that there was so much going on, though, where there's always something interesting to jump to. Right. And we don't totally ignore our human characters because they're in the midst of these attacks. They lure Godzilla into a pit where they say they're going to expose him to poison gas as well as explosives. And I like how when they blow up the pit, all the soldiers move forward en masse to try to see if Godzilla is still alive. I mean, I'll be honest, that's what I would do too. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. But why are they even all there? They've already set up the pit and everything. They don't need all these people still standing around. I'd be there. You kidding? (laughs) They try using high voltage wires against Godzilla. In the first movie, they used 300,000 volts. This time, they jump up to 1 million volts. And it actually works. They hope that the electricity will work to deter Kong as well, but it doesn't. And he somehow eats the electricity, which supercharges him (laughs) because science. He must have been the top of his class. (laughs) While all this has been going on, we keep cutting to Humiko, who's trying to find her boyfriend, Hujita, whose boat sank. Turns out he wasn't on the boat when it sank, but she doesn't know that and heads to Hokkaido to try to find him. The train that she's taking ends up in the path of Godzilla, and her acting when she gets off the train and for some reason doesn't run in the same direction as everyone else is a bit ridiculous. She's acting super hysterical. Godzilla's not even that close to her. It was a bit much, and it didn't really fit with the tone of everything else going on. Then after she reunites with Fujita, they get separated again, and she ends up on a train again. Yeah, that would be the last thing I would do if the last time I was on a train, got hit by a giant monster, would be to get on another train. Which, again, gets attacked by a giant monster, and we get some more of her patented hysterics when Kong pulls her out of the train. And it turns very much into a typical King Kong movie where he's holding the girl, but there's no Empire State Building nearby, so he chooses the Diet Building instead, which is not quite as tall. The scene with him holding a girl and climbing a building is something that was mandated by the licensors of Kong, which is interesting, especially given that they required them to make Kong look different than he looked in the original movie. I like the shots where Fumiko's in his hand and... Her little arms are moving. That's pretty goofy. It's no conga, but it was close. (laughs) The army's about to attack Kong, but Sakurai arrives and tells them not to fire because Kong is holding Fumiko. But how does he know that it's her? And how did the military guys not notice that Kong was holding someone? So to take him out without blowing him up, they load the fruit extract from the island into bombs, detonate them over Kong, and then play the tribal music to lull him to sleep. So Kong ends up letting go of the doll, I mean the girl. They rescue her and suggest making Kong and Godzilla fight again so they will destroy each other. And I like throughout the whole movie how Mr. Taco is always there and he always is thinking in terms of the publicity and the sponsorship. I'm glad they found a way, even if he just kind of pops up out of nowhere, to keep him involved with everything. I like how he just uses his credentials to somehow get into all these top secret meetings. (laughs) Yeah, he shows up in places and they say, what are you doing here? You can't be here. But they don't stop him. And he'll point to his car or he'll point to his little armband and they just let him in. I especially like the part where they sneak up with their camouflage branches. (laughs) Yeah. So another plot element that hasn't come into play until now is Fujita's super strong string, which they use to airlift Kong in some balloons. And like every scene in this movie, right after they talk about doing it, it just cuts right to them doing it. Did he have that all just prepared somewhere? It seemed like he hadn't even found a buyer for it yet. Right. And I like how when they're tying Kong up, you get those little animated guys on top of him. I was taking down notes of how to do the best special effects ever. (laughs) (laughs) 
One of my favorite parts of this movie, sound-wise, was the music when the military is prepping to take down Kong. Because we get the typical Godzilla thing where there's this huge montage and we have this music while the military is getting ready, but it uses the Kong tribal music themes within it, which I really liked, and it was a great mashup of those two characters' styles. I would say the music, to me, is the best part of the entire movie. Would you agree? I don't know about the best. I do like super strong string. <laughs> <laughs> so they end up dropping Kong on Mount Fuji, which is where Godzilla is. And I like how when they initially drop him, he just barrels into Godzilla and they say, wow, he really knows what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> he really understands how to follow the laws of gravity. <laughs> the whole fight is much more choreographed than what we got with Godzilla fighting Angidas in the previous movie, which is good, I guess. It was intentionally made to mimic pro wrestling, which was becoming very popular in Japan at the time. There are some shots where they use either puppets or completely static models for Kong and Godzilla, and they look excellent. It looked like a home video that a kid would make. And there's even one shot of a stop-motion Godzilla drop-kicking Kong, which does not fit in at all, and I wish it was not in there. Agreed. My favorite part is when Kong flips past Godzilla and hits his face on a rock and basically knocks himself out. Yeah, that was pretty funny. So it looks like it's going to end the same way as the first one, but then a lightning storm inexplicably charges Kong up. Yeah, it literally comes out of nowhere on a bright sunny day. And Godzilla ends up going on the defensive as Kong uses his new lightning powers. And I also like when he shoves that tree in Godzilla's mouth. Yeah, that was pretty funny. It's probably not scripted. They probably just didn't like each other, the two actors. <laughs> And they end up both tumbling off a cliff. And we see Kong swimming away. Generic scientist says he's homesick because science. <laughs> and I did like how generic scientist guy made a comment how we can learn from them by adapting to our surroundings. But they did not adapt to their surroundings. They just tore the shit out of everything. Yeah, that was a weird kind of offhanded way to try to throw in some kind of message into a movie that does not have a message. And at the very end, we hear both of their roars. So Godzilla is probably still alive. Right, all he did was fall into the ocean. I would think he'd be okay. I did think that was a bit underwhelming of a way to end it, but overall it was a pretty decent fight. I agree. There was a little bit of repetitiveness where Kong kept getting knocked down and Godzilla kept burying him with rocks and then he'd get up and then it would happen again. Yeah, that's true. So that's the Japanese version, which again was not available over here until very recently. Right. So we had Honda Ishiro back as director. He directed the first Godzilla movie, so this is a huge difference in tone and style and he was not happy about comedy being integrated into the monster scenes that was not his idea he said that it made godzilla look like a guy in a suit but i think given that the rest of the movie was also highly comedic it ended up working Hukube Akira came back to do the music, who again was there for the first movie. Before King Kong vs. Godzilla was made, the original idea conceived by Willis O'Brien, who did the effects in the original King Kong, was to make a movie called King Kong vs. Frankenstein, where Kong would fight a monster that was made up of parts of African animals. But he couldn't get anybody to fund the movie, so he ended up basically selling it to a producer who then turned and sold it to Toho. Toho was looking for a big movie for their 30th anniversary, and they said, let's do King Kong vs. Godzilla. Interesting, they chose to put King Kong's name first. Yeah, even at this time in Japan, King Kong was a much bigger cultural icon than Godzilla. The Godzilla series didn't exist at this point. You had the first movie and a quick cash-in sequel. King Kong hadn't appeared in a movie since 1933, where you had the successful first movie followed again by a quick cash-in sequel. But of course, it was the first one that really made an impact. And that movie was a huge deal, not just in the U.S., but also in Japan. So he was the bigger audience draw at this time. Even in the movie, when Kong appears, they refer to him as a legendary monster. Whereas Godzilla is just that dick that keeps coming back. <laughs> and Kong's powers 
it seems probably came from the idea of Frankenstein being animated by lightning. They just kind of transferred that over to Kong instead to give him an edge over Godzilla. So were there any Kong movies in Japan after this one? There was one more, which was also made by Toho through a different licensing deal. Does he have his electric powers in that one? No. Do they even reference this one? No, which we'll talk about later when we get to Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster, because it's actually related to that movie. Stay tuned for 2028. <laughs> Let's talk about the effects a little bit, and the monster designs. We mentioned that the Kong suit does not look great. It's definitely a disappointment in this movie, especially when you consider that the original King Kong is known for the quality of its effects. Yeah. And given that Tsuburaya Eiji, who was in charge of the effects in this movie, was a big fan of the original King Kong. But he was actually really happy about being able to do more comedy with the monsters, and I wonder if maybe that influenced his designs. What about the Godzilla suit for this one? This Godzilla looks more like a typical dinosaur than he did before, especially on his snout. He's got a longer, less rounded snout. He only has three toes on his feet now instead of four. And he even walks a little bit more hunched over than he did in the previous movies. He's got some big-ass claws on his hand in this one. That stood out to me. They were very long, which I noticed while he was doing his dumb clapping. <laughs> yeah, it definitely feels like the suits were designed to make the fighting a little easier. To have them be able to be more mobile and agile. Definitely. I honestly thought that Puppet Octopus was disappointing in this movie. But in contrast, I really liked the way they shot the real one outside of the composite shots. Yeah, it was kind of cool that they actually used a real octopus, and they would end up doing a much better puppet octopus in later movies. And I think the biggest issue with the movie was just those weird jumps in the script, where the timelines don't seem to match up, and you even have characters jumping from one place to another seemingly at random. But again, given that it's a comedy, it doesn't really bother me that much. The Godzilla series at this point is very interesting in terms of what tone the series is actually trying to find. Yeah, it's only three movies in, and we've gone from super dark and depressing to super goofy. I think the fact that this movie was coming out seven years after the previous movie makes it a little bit more understandable. Yeah, it wasn't looked at at this point as being huge and franchisable. Right, up to this point, Toho had pretty much made just a bunch of standalone monster movies. The only one that was connected to something else was the second Godzilla movie, which again was just a cash-in sequel. But this movie ended up being hugely successful in Japan and still has the highest attendance out of any Godzilla movie in Japan. And that's what led to an actual Godzilla series. Interesting. Let's go to America. For a long time, the only version available over here was the American version, which is drastically different. The differences in the American version fall into three main categories. There's audio, editing, and new scenes. So basically the entire movie. <laughs> so let's talk about the audio. Right from the beginning, with the opening credits, the music is completely different. It has a much more American feel to it, I guess. Right. It's weird because so much of the music is pulled from so many different other movies. The producers actually said that the Japanese music sounded too oriental, so ironically, in some cases, they replaced it with music that sounds stereotypically oriental. And we also have the iconic theme from Creature from the Black Lagoon playing over some of the monster fight scenes, which does not fit at all. It's almost like it was either a last minute decision or somebody just said, I don't really care. Just dig into the archives, pick something out. I will say there are other scenes where the music, in terms of how it's used, works better. There are some scenes in the Japanese version where the music is just kind of playing in the background and the American version puts in some more exciting music for the scenes, maybe. And the timing of the music editing is pretty good, but it's so different that it just doesn't match most of the time. And the Japanese music was so good that they should have just left it alone. Yeah, they still use the tribal music to put Kong to sleep, but not in the same places. Yeah, at least they left some of it in there. As far as the dubbing goes... I honestly thought it wasn't bad. Again, given that this is a comedy movie, the comedic acting from the dubbers was decent. 
and even some of their new dialogue was pretty funny. My, my corns hurt. Ah, you and your corns. But you, you see, my corns always hurt when they're near a monster. Great. When you and the monster meet, be sure you tell him all about your corn problems. Buru, what is it? What hurts? The corns. I don't want to hear about your corns. One thing that did bother me about the dubbing is the Japanese characters keep saying Hokkaido, and then they cut to the UN guy, who's not in Japan, correctly saying Hokkaido. And it happens throughout the entire movie, even in literally shots that are adjacent to each other. And it was really annoying. Flight 311X to Hokkaido crashes. Tragedy struck Hokkaido Airport today. Maybe he could be one of the survivors. Why don't you go to Hokkaido? Do not go to Hokkaido. All right, let's talk about the editing differences. One big one that comes early on is that all those submarine scenes are combined into one scene. I thought that worked much better than the weird jumping around that you got in the Japanese version. Agreed. We even had a bit inserted with Generic Scientist Guy between Godzilla emerging from the iceberg and coming ashore. And there are a lot of little changes like that through the movie that I thought made it flow a lot better and just make more sense. So honestly, I thought most of those changes were improvements. And then lastly, there were a bunch of entirely new scenes put into the American version. Right. They are presented as United Nations reports, and they are terrible. It's kind of equivalent to in Godzilla Raids Again, where they have all that voiceover for no reason. Yeah, it's characters telling us things that we can already see happening. They're not involved in the story at all. It's not like when they stuck Raymond Burr into the American version of the first movie, where he was actually involved in the story. In this movie, they feel completely out of place, and their dialogue is just terrible. The world is stunned to discover that prehistoric creatures exist in the 20th century. And even the very opening of the movie, the very first shot we see of this spinning globe that turns out to be kind of a joke in the Japanese version is played straight in the American version, which makes it funny in a different unintentional way. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And they bring in the worst scientist that I've ever seen in a movie. Way worse than generic scientist guy in the Japanese version. Literally every single line of dialogue he has, it just makes me so angry. Godzilla has a brain about this size. Being instinctive rivals, there is no doubt that they will attempt to destroy one another. Somehow he even knows that Kong draws strength from electricity before it actually happens in the movie. Also, Godzilla has apparently been frozen in the iceberg since the age of dinosaurs. Roughly, this uh, particular form of reptile existed somewhere between 97 and 125 million years ago. Well, that seems an impossibly long period of time for anything to remain alive, even frozen inside of an iceberg. Which makes me wonder how they know what Godzilla is. It seemed like the people behind the American version felt like they could improve on the Japanese version, but it seemed like they were doing it in real time instead of planning beforehand. And I think part of it was probably just a desire to stick in American actors to try to make the movie feel more American and hopefully appeal more to American audiences, which honestly at the time probably worked, or even nowadays. King Kong vs. Godzilla, definitely worth watching, at least once. I agree. It's nowhere near as good as the first movie, but it's a huge step up from Godzilla Raids again. And if you're able to find the Japanese version, that would be the version to watch, I think. I agree. The music alone is enough of a reason to watch this movie, but it is an entertaining monster movie as long as you're okay with seeing a comedic monster movie. If you can only find the American version, that sucks. I would say it's still an entertaining movie. So this is the fifth Godzilla movie we've talked about. I'm starting to think this has been Robert's plan all along because I was not planning on talking about so many Godzilla movies. <laughs> So stick around, because we're definitely going to be continuing the series from here. No more! I'm sick of Godzilla! Subscribe and be happy. <laughs> <laughs>